Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Rad History, where we do our best to give you all the historical content you crave. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do us a favor and drop a like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell so that you can stay up to date on all the radical history we cover. Today, we are going to be discussing a fascinating story of bravery, struggle, and resilience, the Polish resistance movement in World War II. Now, it's no secret that from 1939 to 1945, countless stories of epic battles, heroic actions, and tear-jerking tragedies would be created but for Poland. The struggle for survival was unique and complex, so strap in and follow along as we take a look at the Polish resistance of World War II. For many, Poland's role in the war is passive. They were merely the first of many to fall victim to Nazi Germany. And on a surface level, it is easy to understand why. Some people feel this way because the invasion of Poland only lasted about one month. However, this could not be further from the truth. While it is true that Poland was one of the first to fall to Hitler, they also are without a doubt some of the most dedicated and ferocious opponents the Nazis ever faced. Our story begins in 1939. As you may know, this is the infamous year of the German invasion of Poland. However, the Germans were not the only power looking to add Polish territory to its border. The Soviet Union also took the opportunity to attack Poland about two weeks after the initial German invasion. With the Germans advancing further into Poland every day and Soviet forces striking at their back, it was only a matter of time until Poland fell. Although the situation was bleak, the Poles fought tooth and nail from the first battle to the last with heroic last stands such as the Battle of Wizna. In September of 1939, during the battle, around 700 Poles kept over 40,000 German soldiers, including tanks and artillery, at bay. After three days of fighting, less than 100 of the defenders remained and were forced to surrender, but not before killing or wounding 900 German soldiers and destroying at least 10 tanks. Later in the month, during the Siege of Warsaw, again, the Polish defenders would give German forces a serious thrashing repulsing German attacks multiple times before being forced to surrender. The resolve of the Polish people was incredible and the losses terrible. In the end, Poland was divided between the Soviets and Germans, with the Polish people caught between the jaws of the Soviets and the claws of the Nazis. With Poland in flames, the President of the Republic of Poland, Ignacy Moszczyki, made the decision to resign and leave control of the government to the Marshal of the State, Wiesław Rakszewicz, who was in Paris at the time. Rakszewicz quickly appointed new members to his cabinet and began his role as head of the Polish government. With Poland under enemy occupation, direction and command was needed and so the Polish government in exile was born. This government organization was initially based in France but later moved to London. One unique quality this organization had was the recognition and support of the Allied governments due to pre-war constitutional backing. The best way to think of the government in exile is as the head or brain of the Polish resistance, and there were many, many limbs. In 1940, there were over 100 different Polish resistance groups, many of which had their own political goals in addition to resisting the occupying forces. The first of these is the service of Poland's victory. The first stages of this movement began in September of 1939, before the official fall of Poland. Created by General Julius Rommel, the group was tasked with resistance and eventual reconstruction of a Polish state. It is out of this group that the other main resistance organizations were created. Not long after its creation, the service for Poland's victory was replaced by the Union of Armed Resistance at the orders of General Ladislaw Sikorski. This organization was split into two bodies, one for areas of Soviet occupation and one for areas of German occupation. This fighting force would eventually become known as the Home Army in 1942 after assimilating the vast majority of other resistance groups. The Home Army was incredibly diverse with a variety of political ideologies and people all coming together to face a larger common enemy. The term now attributed to the various resistance efforts is the Polish Underground State. This is a broad term used to encompass the whole of the military political and civilian efforts to not only fight off foreign invaders, but also preserve a Polish state. In order to explain the Polish underground state, we will split it up into three arms, political arm, military arm, and civilian arm. The political arm of the state, like the entire Polish resistance, is complex. The original political body was known as the Political Consultative Committee. The committee was made up of the Socialist, National Peoples, and Labor Parties, these parties came together in order to better control the Home Army, Union of Armed Resistance at the time. 
1940, was recognized by the government in exile as the main political representation in the country. The military arm of the Polish underground state is most commonly known as the Home Army, or Armia Krajowa in Polish. The Home Army was the largest and most powerful military resistance in Poland. At its strongest, the army consisted of as many as 500,000 fighters. The army featured men and women from a variety of areas, political ideologies, and social classes. These people came together to protect Poland and the Polish identity that both the Soviets and Germans were working tirelessly to destroy. The Home Army's operations were as diverse as its roster. The Home Army were masters of intelligence collection, a talent the Allied nations appreciated greatly. In fact, nearly 50% of all Allied intel reports were courtesy of the Home Army and over 80% of these reports were deemed to be high quality by the higher powers. Part of what made the Home Army's intelligence so special is that they were one of the only intel collection sources on the Eastern Front, and by far the most organized. The topics these agents investigated included the infamous B-2 rocket, the Holocaust, and concentration camps, German submarines, and several key German operations. The Home Army also ran effective propaganda campaigns by way of printed bulletins and newspapers of which tens of thousands of copies would circulate. When it came to combat, the Home Army had two types of combatants, full and part-time. The full-time members would undergo regular military training, permanent residence in barracks, and were generally uniformed as best as possible. These were the men who openly fought the Germans in both major planned operations or uprisings and pitched battles. These men were better armed than their part-time comrades, but still suffered greatly from the lack of friendly supply lines. Most of the weapons used by the soldiers were guns from caches hidden after or during the 1939 invasions. Weapons raided from enemy supplies or black market equipment purchased from other sources and occasionally even the Germans. There was some manufacturing, but this was not effective due to the German occupation. Overall, the Home Army was so poorly armed that at its maximum strength of 500,000, it was estimated that there was only enough equipment to properly kit about 30,000 soldiers. While these men were usually inadequately armed, they still expressed no fear in battle and participated in several major offensive operations the largest of which was Operation Tempest. Operation Tempest was an organized armed uprising across the whole of Poland. This attack was planned as the Red Army drove ever further into German territory. While the operation did find some success untimely, the Home Army failed to truly liberate Poland. The most famous battle of the operation is the Warsaw Uprising. In 1944, as the Soviets moved closer to Warsaw, the defenders rose up and ferociously attacked the Germans. Initially, Polish forces made great headway. However, the Soviet forces ensured their defeat by refusing radio contact and ceasing military operations outside of Warsaw. This allowed the Germans to not only defeat the resistance fighters, but also raise the city to the ground. By the end, over 200,000 Poles were dead, many from mass executions. This action is a perfect example of the hostility between the Poles and Soviets even in the face of a common enemy, a hostility that was well-earned and would only continue. Modern Russian historians claim that the failure was due to the mistakes made by Polish military leaders. This claim can be neither proven nor disproven. The Home Army were also experts at sabotage. They took every opportunity to fight, even when they could not bear arms. Saboteurs struck at everything they could get their hands on. Power grids, oil and fuel supplies, and factory production, just to name a few. One especially clever tactic was to build flaws into German equipment. This approach alone led to the destruction of thousands of aircraft engines, cannon muzzles, and artillery rounds. The final type of action taken against the Germans was assassination. Over 5,000 Germans were assassinated throughout dozens of operations, including Operation Heads, Berkel, and Kutschera. The last arm of the Polish underground state is the civilian arm. This organization was called the Directorate of Civil Resistance at first, but became known as the Directorate of Underground Resistance after joining with the Directorate of Covert Resistance. This arm was responsible for the preservation of a true Polish culture and state identity. They achieved this by keeping institutions such as court, schools, and law enforcement intact and active during the occupations. Throughout the war, this arm expanded so much that by the time it ended, there were underground schools in higher education, cultural, and societal activities such as book publishing, concerts, theaters, and even a parliament. Even though the Polish resistance was the most organized and effective of the war, their efforts did not stop there. Polish men and women would go on to fight the Nazis at every turn. 
Everywhere from the Middle East and Africa to Nazi-occupied France and Britain-Polish warriors could be found fighting and dying for the freedom of their people. The Polish Air Force was especially deadly. During the invasion of Poland, they destroyed over 250 German aircrafts and damaged nearly 300 more. Later, Polish pilots would fight in British skies during the Battle of Britain. By the end of the battle, Polish pilots were responsible for 12% of combat victories while only representing 5% of total active pilots. Polish soldiers were some of the finest in the Allied forces, impressing even the most hardened of commanders with their resolve and skill, including the famous Sir Winston Churchill. Wait, with the Poles being so instrumental in the fight against the Nazis, why were they so often left to face their enemies alone? Well, the answer is politics. Even during the heat of the war, the Allied nations were often reluctant to give direct aid to the Polish resistance in fear that they may upset the already unhinged Stalin. Don't forget, through all of this, the Soviets were never a friend of the Poles. They just stopped being a direct enemy, temporarily. Stalin had no intentions of long-term peace with Poland and only came to the negotiating table when it suited him most. But Soviet-Polish relations are a topic for another video. If it's one you would like to see, please feel free to like and comment below. Overall, Poland's role in the Second World War is incredibly complex, but also incredibly inspiring. Through everything, the heart of the Polish people never once wavered. One can only hope that if the time comes, they too can muster the courage of the Polish people.